They're a new generation of Democrats, Bill Clinton and Al Gore, and they don't think the way the old Democratic Party did. They've called for an end to welfare as we know it, so welfare can be a second chance, not a way of life. They've sent a strong signal to criminals by supporting the death penalty, and they've rejected the old tax and spend politics. Clinton's balanced 12 budgets, and they've proposed a new plan investing in people, detailing $140 billion in spending cuts they'd make right now. Clinton Gore, for people, for a change. George Bush is running attack ads. He says all these people would have their taxes raised by Bill Clinton. Scary, huh? Misleading, says the Washington Post. And the Wall Street Journal says Clinton has proposed to cut taxes for the sort of people featured in Bush's ad. So why is Bush doing it? Because George Bush has had the worst economic record of any president in 50 years. George Bush is trying to scare you about Bill Clinton. But nothing could be more frightening than four more years. It's 1992, we're slashing welfare rolls, we're killing black people who have the brain damage, we're doing it all, it's a new Democratic Party. I am not Bill Clinton, I am Michael Brooks, and this is the Michael Brooks Show, where left is best, as it is everywhere else. We're broadcasting live from Brooklyn, USA, with super producer Matt Leck. Hello. Chief Economist David Griscom. How's it going? Super producer David Slavic roaming the digitosphere and every other facet of the ever-growing, ever-expanding, ever-aggressive Michael Brooks Show universe on this week's program. Anna Kasparian, she's a host and a producer for The Young Turks, and she and I are destroying one of the most dumb, craven, dishonest, stupid, low-rate, pathetic, coke-funded, aggrieved careerist hacks in modern punditry, Dave Rubin. And then Bree Joy Gray, she's a senior editor at The Intercept, and more importantly for our purposes, she's crew on The Michael Brooks Show. We're talking about Sorry to Bother You, why the oligarchs don't want you to see it, why it is the socialist movie of our time that captures class and race in distinct, sharp, terrifying, and funny ways, plus... AOC and Bernie are hitting the trail, hit the trail in Kansas. Bree was there, and she has a message from the heartland. It's a message of socialist humanism that can win. We're also going to have to throw one of, and I say this a lot, so I want to underscore, literally one of the worst people in American life in the latter half of the 20th century, for some reason is still around. He's going into the gulag. He had opinions. He's, he was so bad that I'm going to have the back of the gamer contingent is my only hint for this week's Gulag. And then David Griscom continuing his quest for the crown, his Oedipal drive against Richard Wolf will give us an economic minute, a shout out from the king, all that and much, much more on this week's Michael Brooks show. But first... A couple of days ago, I was greeted uh, with a headline of an op-ed on Twitter that said something to the effect of, and it was actually changed, but the, that Chuck Schumer is playing the long game. And his long game was, don't put any pressure on far-right, corporate, centrist, whatever the hell you want to call them, corporate Democrat, hack senators, to vote against Brett Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court. Because the long-term game is the midterm elections. It was an interesting reframing of short-term is apply pressure to make sure that the Supreme Court is not in the far right's palm for in the far, far right's pocket for generations, overturning Roe v. Wade, re-legalizing indentured servitude, and everything else that the Federalist Society and their funders could possibly cook up. No, it's to make sure that a handful of mediocrities hold on to their Senate seats. And I want to be really clear, and I've said this many times, you need to register to vote, and you need to make sure that Democrats get control of at least the House, and very importantly, the United States Senate. You can't have full Republican control of government. But that headline really did illustrate just the other death, utter zombification 
except zombies at least can be physically threatening. The full wuss baggery, the claps of the mainstream corporate Democratic Party as so exhaustingly exemplified by Chuck Schumer. The first illicit history we did on this show for patrons was of the third way. It is the ideological consensus that emerged from the 1980s of center-left parties across the Western Hemisphere, and they also exported that toolkit to Brazil, South Africa, and Eastern Europe, as well as Latin America. Parties on the left shifted. The rise of global capital meant that labor unions were under assault, the rules of the road were rewritten to favor corporations, and the third way arose from the winds of Thatcher, Reagan, and neoliberalism and said, we'll accept all of the baselines of global predator capitalism. We will portray our core constituencies in terms of labor and income inequality, but I also wanted to in, uh, uh, sort of underline in those Clinton ads, they also weren't always pseudo-woke either. The original third way was quite willing to play on racial division and appeal to bigoted and xenophobic sentiment as exemplified by Bill Clinton's runs in 1992 and 1996. This formula was electorally successful for a brief period of time, and it matched the proliferation of knowledge workers, brand consultants, economists, professional classes, as well as tech bubbles. It's done. That ideology and the conditions that led to it and the compromises that it evoked are over. The only alternative that we had really in modern politics did come from Latin America, the pink tide. Very mixed results. Some incredible breakthroughs like the Bossa Familia program and a generally very successful record by the Lula government in many key respects. Some huge successes in the beginning of Hugo Chavez and Chavismo in Venezuela some significant strides in Paraguay, Ecuador, and Argentina against the dictates of global finance capital and for the environment, indigenous people's rights, and labor. The pink tide, which is the closest we can look to, has been undermined by three things. Number one, and we can never escape this in talks of resurgent socialism, U.S. foreign policy. We're not in the Condor years anymore where the CIA coordinated with right-wing governments to murder leftists across Latin America, but we do have a DOJ and a federal court system in the United States that have aided in a one-sided corruption investigation in Brazil, which has entirely politicized the judiciary and functions as a judicial coup to keep the most important presidential candidate, Lula da Silva, the most popular one, as a political prisoner. It functioned in Argentina, undermining Christina Kirchner on behalf of vulture capitalists out of New York City. Second, those parties and governments own failings. In some cases, obviously authoritarian and corruption uh, problems in, if we're being honest at times, in Venezuela and Nicaragua, and conversely in Brazil, the failure to take on certain fundamental uh, sort of capital and oligarch regimes. That's where they made their own mistakes amidst their many successes and the relentless attacks, even on the most moderate of them, from US foreign policy. So number three, we need to recognize that the third way is dead, but we also need to learn the fact that they built a global model for themselves. They tried to literally export a global brand of governance. And so we need to recognize that along with Bernie Sanders here, the social movements here, Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, but also Lula Livre in Brazil, also fees must fall and land appropriation in South Africa. This is a synchronized moment for an actual humanist socialist politics. And it's not just an ethical demand that we coordinate it globally, it's a strategically necessary one. The third way is dead, and you could see it in the exhausted, limp dick leadership of Chuck Schumer. And a new way is waiting to be born. And it's our job to synchronize the social bases, the movements, and the politics to make it happen. So 
Pick where you're going to protest, pick where you're going to occupy, pick where you're going to strike and register and get out to vote. All of the above, it's synchronized. Guys, this is the open forum area as always, but I've been thinking about this a lot. I really would recommend people who are new patrons and just becoming patrons to go back and listen to that first Third Way episode because it's still as dead and as exhausted as it is. It still sets the template. I think it's uh, very important that when we're building strategies against the third way, that we do actually take that international approach. Yes. Um, in doing research over the development of the third way, you see that Bill Clinton and Blair and a lot of these folks, not only were they modeling off of each other, they yep. were actually meeting and they were oh, talking yeah. about this kind of strategy. Yep. And that's the really disadvantage that the left is at today is that we've lost the international that we had in the early 20th century. I mean, we don't have this kind of you know international left movement and, you know, we can't rely on, you know, sort of outside, you know, there's no like, kind of Soviet Union style force that was, you know, giving money to left right. groups. I mean, that doesn't exist at all anymore. And that necessarily wasn't necessarily a good thing in the first place. Um, but, you know, really starting to think internationally and building solidarity across groups is so crucial. And I mean, I think just, you know, finally, you see that these kind of left movements that are happening now with Corbyn and with Sanders are really popular. And that the ideology of the third way was never really something that was meaningful for working people. It was much more meaningful for a kind of alliance between uh, capital and, and the political class, which is why we have this incredible opportunity now to challenge that. Hello. Hello. Well, at the start of the end of the world, what is feeling just like every other morning before. Now I is this the third way song, Matt? This is the official third way song. Uh, explain your thinking behind why this is the official third way. Well, I just think it's always important. Uh, you know, the Thomas Frank book, for instance, like Listen Liberal. Right. The the reason you engage in that sort of uh, experience, uh, sort of, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm distracted by my soundtrack. Um, <laughs> I think everybody is. The reason you engage in that is to see how far you've come. <laughs> Uh, because saying there's a certain Panglossian nature to the Third Way project? Well, when you look at to see what politicians are doing, they're generally reacting to... That's enough of that. They're generally reacting to okay. underlying conditions, right? Right. Like, and not, right. it's not their personal moral feeling and willing to sell out that ultimately is really what needs to be policed here. Right. It's the, it's the facts on the ground that they're responding to. And it is pretty remarkable to see those ads. Because, I mean, now it's sort of bottled down to what they want us to remember which is like the economy stupid the economy was great and that sort. but like remember like right. i feel your pain i feel your like pain. that and it's like not like zzz, zzz, what's that we're it's uh, a mentally incapacitated black guy <laughs> yeah. i just zapped that's right i'm a new kind of democrat the wall street journal says buzz buzz <laughs> wall street journal <laughs> yeah. says buzz buzz middle class tax cuts and get puerto rican people off of their asses and into mcdonald's yes yeah. i'm a democrat for the 21st century and so it, I, I just think it's important to register that the strength of third wayism isn't uh, is in the past, and it's important to register that for like I think it just in terms, in terms of like thinking we can win and having that sort of uh, tone, I guess. I agree, and also the other thing I would say too is that even though the third way, this it, it, there's a lot to learn from because of how they globalized it and how they learned and how they did create a coordinated toolkit and right they had conferences in new york city and milan and washington dc um and uh schroeder and blair and clinton but also cardozo a lot of other leaders were there but there is a way in which that sort of kind of the notion of social, social moderation, moderation. Limited, limited government, government to, to train, train people, people to have, have skills, skills for capitalism, capitalism so that there can be limited upward mobility and quote-unquote meritocracy, uh, along with a essentially a highly deregulated, deregulated environment. environment. That, that is, is the idea. idea. Like, on one hand, you say, oh, what a weird little sort of 90s thing, thing or a 2001 thing. thing. On the other hand, that's Steve Pinker's book. book. Mm. That, that is, is the governing ideology in and Sam, Sam Harris, Harris is, is the new Republic, Republic editorial page of the A's. This, this stuff will never die because, because it will always be the default setting of a certain part of the elite, elite that we oppose. Exactly. exactly. And like, like, that's, that's the thing about the third way movement and triangulation, triangulation as a strategy, which was uh, Bill Clinton's right. big, uh, you know, 
theoretical, theoretical contribution. contribution that's that's what what anyone anyone, anyone who understands basic, basic rhetoric, rhetoric will realize how cheap of a, 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 a simple trick that it was. I mean, really what the, the third way triangulation tactic did is it tried to um, tamper down actual like class um, contradictions. Right. And then like, you know, we saw working conditions getting worse, people being unable to, you look at the United States, for example, you see a profit motive in healthcare. You see healthcare prices rising out of control. Right? right, but, but because, because of this alliance between you know finance capital, capital and the Wall Street class that started to become to dominate the uh, the, uh, the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party actually can't per, you know put forth the solution um, that you know is, is proper, which would be you know universal health care. Instead, we have this very complicated uh, solution that we were perf- um, pursuing in the U.S., which was uh, you know which was Obamacare. And look, it touches a lot of very important things, and it provided a lot of relief to people who were. Um, in significant, uh, in, in a harm's way. But at the same time, it still opens up huge opportunities for profit for a class. And that's why we sort of are in this, you know, strange position now. Arguably, um, it was a bailout of an industry. Well, I mean, you saw lots yes. of money does yeah. go to the insurance yep. industries through Obamacare. And, you know, we can't, it's not, I'm not arguing anything like, you know, abolish Obamacare, but we see these are the kind of technocratic solutions that that, that ideology offers. And they're not solutions that actually will last and actually prefer, right. you know, um, against the onslaught of, uh, you know, our opponents. Because it's about power. You deal with the power equation or you don't. Um, there's no way to mediate it. And there's, you know, the the cynical acquiescence of Clinton and Blair. There's the innovative and in many ways successful of a Lula. And it still gets beat back, right? Um, if it has any, you know, in the Brazil example, 40 million people out of poverty, you know, a massive austerity thing that you can actually deconstruct. And I would add as well, I think my read of this is a lot of this is coming down to the fact that for all of the moderation, they would not privatize Petrobras. They would not move to strip state assets. And that is the ultimate vulture impulse. I also wonder, and people have said, oh, we've talked about this before, Chuck Schumer has a couple of imaginary friends that live in Massapequa, New York, and they're called the Baileys. And I, this is not, none of this is comedy. This is literally true. And apparently, he talks to these imaginary friends and gives them, liter, uh, he gets political advice from them um, because they're his image of like a median income white suburban voters. And what Matt and I were concerned about earlier was what if the Koch brothers have gotten to the Baileys? What if Chuck Schumer's imaginary friends have been compromised by oligarch money? Imagine like Chuck in one of his like theater of the mind sessions in his Senate office and he's just like, why are you guys flying off to the French Riviera? I thought you lived in Massapequa and we're in regional sales. And they're just like, don't, don't worry about it. Point is, is that, look, Kavanaugh, not my first pick, but you got to respect the institution, all right? Thanks, Chuck. Like that Chuck's ideology is so corrupted and wuss bagified that even his own imagination has been corrupted by money. <laughs> that's, that's actually probably not too far off. <laughs> even my imagination is a Wall Street subsidy. <laughs> I mean, that's like all of the working class friends that the people on the New York Times editorial board seem to have, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like when David Brooks is like, oh, dude, I'm so sorry that I invited you to a place where you could get an Italian sounding sandwich. That was fucked up. You want Chipotle? Do you want Chipotle? Chipotle. Chipotle. Sorry, I'm not trying to freak you out. That was an it was that a year ago. David Brooks wrote a column where he literally he first he made up, and I'm just gonna I can't imagine that he didn't make up. He had a friend who was low income, which like where did David Brooks meet this person? Is this like a former maid that he called up to bother into having like a lunch date with him? And then they went to some like like a sandwich shop, but I guess one where maybe you could get like Brock the Rob in your sandwich. And, and Brooks was just like, oh, yeah, this, this chick, this broad was totally freaked out. There was Italian vegetables. She couldn't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> if you know an Italian person, then you're rich in <laughs> David Brooks's right. world. Yeah, that, right. was, that was absolutely incredible. I mean, David it, Brooks like, I remember when I met my first Italian person. 
William F. Buckley handed me $100,000 to uh, write an essay on why black kids fail at school. And then he introduced me to Giuseppe. <laughs> it's like all these rich people. It's like they're, they're, they're either, they, they either have like a poor or person of color friend who they like, con like almost like some type of like Rhodesian painting. Like they romanticize like a noble savage that's freaked out by sandwich shops. And they're just like, God, I wish I lived in a simpler time where I didn't have HBO go. And I didn't know what Italian sandwiches were. Or they're like, yeah, I think poor people should just be terrorized by police and standardized testings at all times. Well, the main social interaction these people have with the people outside of their social classes when they're being made food for. Literally. <laughs> Literally. But then you would kind of think if your experience is primarily food service industry, then maybe those people would know what an Italian vegetable was. Actually, I have to say, as somebody who spent a long time working in the food service industry, like working class people, since most people have to work in, in restaurants now, have a better understanding of uh, food culture than a lot of rich people that I run across. <laughs> oh, really? That should be exploited. Like, yeah. Working class people should try to sabotage rich people's diets. It's just like inserting <laughs> just dumb shit into it. I mean, I feel like partially what's uh, what's her name? The actress who always people always the goop lady. Who is oh, that? that's what she's doing. Gwyneth Paltrow is totally culture jamming rich yeah. people. She's like, she's like, this is like bull cum. It'll be good for your eyes. <laughs> and then she sells. And I'm I always stipulate that if anybody in this world is open to like an Ayurvedic diet suggestion, it's me. That chick is out literally like, oh yeah, no, it's uh, it's the it is a uh, it is it is blood pus of a donkey. Yeah, we need and to find it will reverse your aging process by we ten need, years. We need some sort of animal product that we can get really cheaply in mass, and then we need to put it in some sort of yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> That's class warfare. That's what we really need to be engaged right. in. Class war. Like for generations, the Tibetans stirred bull cum <laughs> for like industrial runoff, but it wasn't in ancient China. It'll be great for your digestion. Um, all right, let's get to actually, let's get to a guy that w is to the shout out. Do we have uh, Danarchy ready? Get to uh, the shout out, uh, shout out, shout out, creepy, shout out, shout out, shout out, weird. I think that's creepy. It, 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 it's incredible. Shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. Shout out. This is crazy. Shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. This is out of control. Shout out, shout out. That's creepy. Shout out, shout out. That's weird. Shout out, creepy. Shout out, weird. Shout out, crazy. Shout out, shout out. This is crazy. Shout out. This is out of control. Shout out. This is weird. Shout out, shout out. Shout out comes to you courtesy. Uh, this is one that will make uh, crew big Waz, Wazni Lambre. And I actually have a uh, co-host of Woke Bros. And I have an announcement about that. It's coming up in a minute. Uh, it'll make him very happy. He is a King James stan. And we should all be King James stans. Incredible basketball player. And a guy, as people have pointed out, it's absolutely true that it is a fundamental indictment of our politics that a wealthy person has to intervene for something that should be universally provided for. That being said, he's stepping up and doing this. This isn't a charter school, it's a public school. Uh, it's gonna be in Akron, Ohio, and it is a school that's gonna serve 240 at-risk students and will be the, the, uh, attending the inaugural year of the I Promise School. Uh, this is the school that, Bronze, uh, that LeBron's uh, Family Foundation uh, approach the Akron School Board in 2017 with the uh, uh, the idea of assist of cr assisting creating a school to design to help at risk kids who are lagging behind in their studies and struggling at home. The school also has multiple interventions outside of the classroom and in the surrounding areas um, that kids need after school time, bikes, nutrition, various things like that. In contrast to another neoliberal poison promoted through Bill Gates and the Obama administration, the idea that, oh yeah, a person's entire family and social structure doesn't matter. It just matters that we terrorize teachers into giving them tests. LeBron's doing the absolute opposite. It's an amazing project. He's an amazing, uh, really incredibly admirable guy. And here he is talking with Don Lemon 
And I appreciated the fact that in addition to talking about this great project and in total contrast from, you know, I mean, the biggest contrast obviously being someone like Michael Jordan, he used this opportunity as an athlete, as a leader to call out Donald Trump's uh, racism and divisiveness. This is uh, Don Lemon and LeBron James. Also, I don't know what's going on with Don Lemon. Don Lemon went from like a, I, I used to joke that Don Lemon was like the guy that, like that Eddie Murphy pretended to be in Beverly Hills Cop. Like Don Lemon would walk around Upper East Side asking cops why he wasn't being stopped and frisked. And now all of a sudden, Don Lemon, Don Lemon's going to be like wearing a dashiki in a year because of Donald Trump's piggishness. All right, let's check this out. Are, are athletics important to th these kids? Or you think it's their minds right now? No, I think both. I think um, I think athletics are important, but also their mind. I think both. I think it just plays. Um, it is bring when you're when you're part of sports and you're a part of your mind. It just brings some so much camaraderie and so much fun. You know, we we, we are in a position right now in America, more importantly, where this whole this race thing is is, is taking over. You know, and and um, because one because I believe our president is kind of trying to divide us. Um, but I think kind of yeah, he is <laughs> he is not. I don't want to say kind of. He's he's dividing us. And and what I noticed over the last few months. Um, that he's kind of used sport to kind of divide us. And, I, and that's something that I can't relate to because I know that sport was the first time I ever was around someone white, you know, and I, and I, and I got an opportunity to see them and learn about them. And they got an opportunity to learn about me and we became very good friends. And I was like, oh, wow, this is all because of sports. And sports has never been something that divide people. It's always been something that brings someone together. LeBron James is awesome. This project is great and obviously... You know, we'll leave the classy ways of calling out our white supremacist probably wants to F his daughter grotesque far right president. But that's an elegant way of doing it. And he's absolutely right. All right. We got a touch of housekeeping. And then I'm telling you, this interview that Anna Kasperi and I recorded a couple days ago. I don't think Dave Rubin is capable of shame. And he obviously has no conscience, but it might, even he might get a little singed by this. It's, it's a little, it's, it's ruthless shit. We're going to get to that in a minute, but uh, first two pieces of housekeeping get to, uh, pretty soon we'll have our own URL for this. We have our own YouTube page now and, um, and basically one, sometimes a lot of people are still subscribing to my personal page, which is not this page. So look up Michael Brooks show on uh, YouTube. If you type it in, this should come up. Um, you want to just click on the actual main page. Um, and as you can see, yeah, we're getting there. We're actually, we've only been up for about a week, so we're actually almost at 2000 people. Um, but we already have a lot of, a uh, lot of clips up. And it's a great way to, you know, promote the show, obviously. That's where um, the, these clips will be from now on. That's where these clips will be. So then you don't have to miss. Like if you say, hey, I want to know the Griscom Economic Minute. They're going to be up there as discrete segments. I liked that part where, uh, you know, they were dunking on so-and-so or, you know, Michael's analysis of the pink tide or whatever the interviews we already have several up there including two unlocked post games um so subscribe to that channel today and um if you click on videos i think it gives you a sense of how many um what is this uh, music what is this beat mr me too clips i like i usually you know i it's usually more momentum for the pitches right this uh, is my speed <laughs> this is definitely i know it's your speed uh, so subscribe to that today on October 6th. Do you have that t uh, tweet ready? Just one second. Okay. As you know, if you're a patron of either the Michael Brooks show or count the dings, uh, Waz and I co-host woke bros once a week, which is its own show. It's great. It gets, I mean, this is a collaboration that people really have actually been wanting and asking for for a long time. And it's a ton of fun to do it. We cover politics, pop culture, sports. We're doing, uh, we're actually uh, following uh, the Sasha Baron Cohen show, which is a lot of fun. Uh, so there's a lot going on there. And on October 5th, not 6th, excuse me, October 5th, this tweet is up here. 
at the Bell House um, in Williamsburg. Back to back pod with all of those guys, uh, Amin, Jade, and of course, Big Waz, Mariano, a couple of other guys. They're doing a live show. And as you can see in this tweet, it says plus special guests. Well, my friends, one of those special guests is me. Waz and I are doing a live uh, Woke Bros um, and a bigger Count the Dings collaboration. Tickets are actually, I think, almost sold out. Um, but go to this link here. You can click on it. The Bell House event. Um, and uh, I'll be tweeting it out uh, as well. So that's the housekeeping. All right, guys. Uh, make sure if you are a patron that all of your uh, info is up to date. Um, credit card and PayPal wise. Just so we don't get like a bunch of. We always there's always a certain amount of declines. It just helps that we get as few as possible because it literally helps us like with planning and budgeting and decisions and things that we make that are important that we can kind of keep close tabs on that. So make sure everything is up to date. Um, we are now I can really see that first 2000 patrons in the horizon. It's not that far away and there will be significant uh you know, just upticks in terms of like what we're able to invest in and sustaining the incredible, like we already do quite a bit of output. Um, so it really makes a difference. It allows us to cover uh, all of the stories we cover and in the way we cover it, we want to be obligated to nobody besides you. Patreon.com slash TMBS, patreon.com slash TMBS. Check out all the different membership levels. If you're at 21 or above, we're doing regular conference calls. Those are fascinating. Recently, had on the line, we had two patrons uh, amongst several others, but two were uh, one was calling in from Chile, one was calling in from Istanbul. We did like a regional tour by tour. Very, and of course, the Discord community is going 24 7, expanding and generating a lot of political and social projects together. If you haven't yet, it's time today. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Patreon.com slash TMBS. We'll be right back with this just brutal takedown of one of the dumbest men on earth. But also Craven. Also, people are saying Craven. Anna Kasperi and I breaking down Dave Rubin right back on The Michael Brooks Show. Welcome back to uh, The Michael Brooks Show. Actually, you haven't left, but this is in fact a pre-record. We're dropping in the middle of this show. It's a joint diss track that many of you have been wanting for quite some time. Joining me now is Anna Kasparian. She is a host and producer at the Young Turks. Anna, how are you doing? Thanks for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. It's my pleasure. Um, I think that this has been in the works, even just like spiritually for a long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I got to be honest. Uh, so I listen to you and Sam quite often when I'm you know, commuting home from work. Right. And... It's very rare for me to come across a show that, like, you guys get it. I mean, you guys understood what was going on with the so-called, you know, intellectual dark web before most people realized what was going on. And um, there was just a period of time where I felt like I couldn't say anything because I wanted to be the bigger person. And I'm specifically talking about Dave Rubin. Right. But finally, I, I just decided, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to stay quiet anymore. So. Yeah, please. And let me just say, definitely for the majority report with Sam, obviously that's not a bigger person show. Mm -hmm. And even <laughs> the Michael Brooks show, not a bigger person show. Uh, and I will totally play the role in this uh, diss track. You can be like more, uh, you know, uh, refined and fair um, <laughs> and, and charitable. I will take all of the low blows. I will call Dave Rubin stupid. I will make comments about the vacant look in his eyes. I'll do all of that. So don't worry. I got you. And let's get started. No, I, I actually really appreciated you talking about Dave Rubin because I actually I felt, first of all, I think that this whole intellectual dark, dark web nonsense from Sam Harris to Jordan Peterson to Dave Rubin is actually really a genuinely really toxic thing on in the culture. That's why, like, I have mm -hmm. a book contract on it, and I'm actually writing about it. Like, I think this actually has some stakes. And then I also thought mm -hmm. that the way the dude utilized 
like I, I look, I watched the Young Turks. I never really watched Dave Rubin. I had no idea who he was. And anytime I came across him in any iteration, I honestly just thought he was pretty boring. And I thought that mm -hmm. the way he just sort of so cynically used those who had allowed him to get a start was pretty disgusting and you needed to come out and hit back. So maybe you could maybe just start by talking about that process specifically. Yeah. So the thing about Dave Rubin that I think a lot of people who don't know him personally don't understand is that regardless of what you think about how shady he is or how, you know, unintelligent he is. He's yes, a charming yes. guy. Oh. He's a very charming guy. And so when he started working at TYT, first off, um, he and uh, his now husband, uh, David Janet, were pretty persistent. So at that time, we were at Current TV, and we were just starting to get some positive recognition. And it was a good feeling. And so Dave Rubin moves out to L.A. from New York. You know, it was very clear that he needed a stable job. And he just kept telling me over and over again, oh, I, would, I would just really love to work with you guys. I just feel like what you guys are doing is so smart. You know, you guys are really cutting edge. <laughs> I, I love the ideology. I love the fearness. Like, uh, it, it was just one compliment after the other. And I got to be honest, I, I was an idiot at that moment because I believed him and I genuinely thought, like, this is a good dude. And I, I want to be close to him you know like mm -hmm. he would invite me to dinner all the time and I would go as often as I could and we really did develop what I thought was a genuine friendship and I remember one year um, you know I threw a little birthday party for him and I introduced him to all my friends and I'm not making this stuff up like if you go to my personal YouTube channel there's literally a video there where we're celebrating the holidays together with my close friends um, so anyway he always had so he starts working with us mm -hmm. and i noticed that like every conversation we had was about pay and look i i get it because working at a an independent news organization like you're not going to make a ton of money right. right like you see the salaries that people at cnn are making or msnbc and you know he was really aspiring to that mm -hmm. and i just let him know, you know, and made it abundantly clear. It's very unlikely that any of us are going to get paid millions of dollars. And he was doing this 30 minute a week show, which I thought was fine. It didn't seem to me that he really cared too much about politics. Right. Um, the person behind that show who really made it happen was his husband who like, I love that guy. I mean, I haven't talked to him. I'm sure he doesn't have great thoughts about me, but he was a very hard worker. He was very smart and he was, just super ambitious. And so he would put together these 30 minute shows for Dave Rubin. And then he would have all these notes uh, on a one sheet for him. And then he would come in, literally do a 30 minute show. It was a panel show. So, I mean, you just ask a few questions in that, you know, format. Right. And then he would get upset that, that Jank wasn't paying him, you know, at least 150 grand for that once a week, 30 minute show. Now, if you think you can make money somewhere else, do you? Like, I didn't have a problem with him leaving. And when he left, we were all on really good terms. We were still good friends. Right. You know, uh, Cenk had like a sending off video with Dave Rubin, and they're very friendly with one another because, again, they were on very good terms. And then out of nowhere, he goes on um, Rogan's program, and he just starts shitting on us. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea why, and it was... It was really hurtful. So I, mes I messaged him. I sent him a text message. And I was like, Dave, what's going on? And he's like, no, 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 I'm not attacking you. I'm attacking Jenk. And I was like, but <laughs> first of all, you're attacking the Young Turks. I'm the, like one of the main hosts of the Young Turks. I think even like, people that know nothing about the Young Turks would say, like, or very little would say Jenk and then Anna. Like you are the definitely one of the two most identifiable people with that brand. Yeah, I've been there for 11 years. Yeah. I've been, you know, hosting the main show for 11 years with Jenk. So when you say the Young Turks, that includes me. So, and, and even if he was just attacking Jenk, it didn't make any sense. Jenk bent over backwards for that guy. Right. So let me give you an example. When he left, Dave Rubin wanted 100% ownership of his YouTube channel. Now, mind you, it was TYT's producers TYT's editors, TYT's studio, like that content, legally speaking, easily belonged to TYT. But right. Jake was like, you know what? I, 
no, I'm not going to be a dick. I'm going to let him keep 100% ownership of his channel. And any revenue that he earns, he can keep it. Like, we're not going to try to, you know, take a cut or a percentage of that. And I thought that was really big of Jenk. And there were also numerous occasions where he said something stupid on the main show while he was a panelist. And then later would run to Jenk and beg Jenk to cut that out of the video. And Jenk would do it because he didn't want Dave Rubin to be harassed by audience members or whatever it is. And so it's just amazing to me that Jenk bent over backwards for this guy over and over again. And then he turned around and just started trashing us. Do you th- so, I mean, because that's an interesting, like, there's this bigger ecosystem that he fits into. And he just kind of, you know, he's like the easiest interview on the planet for any type mm-hmm. of right wing, rebranded, old ideas, repackaged as, I mean, it is pretty funny that they call it the intellectual dark web, right? Like, let's let's literally self-identify as, like, the secret part of the Internet where you buy organs and child porn. Mm-hmm. But whatever, it's taking that aside. Did I lose her? Oh, fuck. Sorry, man. I don't know what happened. It's sorry. Nice. I don't know what happened. I have no idea what happened. I'm sorry. We'll just keep going. It's okay. Um, um, yeah, I just... The intellectual dark web thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that branding-wise, that was probably a bad idea. <laughs> and I get where they were trying to come from. You know, right. we're hip, we're, we're edgy, we're like, we're very naughty for having these beliefs. But... The, re- the fact of the matter is, I mean, look, I think that Dave Rubin shouldn't be in the same group as these guys, because even if you disagree with what, you know, you know, Peterson has to say or Harris has to say, I don't deny that they're smart guys. Like, I disagree with them vehemently on, on some things, um, Peterson more than Harris. But I, I think that they're at least intellectual And what Dave Rubin has done, which is what he tried to do with us, is find what's emerging or what could do really well or could go viral and just latch onto that. And hopefully, you know, you can kind of mooch off of the benefits, the financial benefits of being part of that group. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, like I, you know, I probably have some disagreements with you about Harris and Peterson because I don't I mean, first of all, I wouldn't I mean, you know, I don't know. Smart is a relative term. And I and I do think that there are really toxic influences in the culture in a lot of ways. And I think, but two mm-hmm. things that re- that relate to what you're saying though, that's, in- I mean, one is the, it, one, the bigger point is what does it say about all of these guys that they're so willing and excited and happy to have a clear, just sort of blank slate, nothing media operator like Dave Rubin, be one mm-hmm. of the core sort of like PR conduits for not only their ideas, but also like Mike Cernovich and Milo and all of yeah. these things that I would, frankly, I would put them on the same continuum as a hundred percent, but I'm sure they would want to have some distinct branding from. And then number two, I think you have also identified Dave Rubin as like basically just a, a type that stands alone in media as just like this completely amoral, totally free floating mm-hmm. committed to nothing and just a scavenger. Yeah, he's that is the best way to describe him. And you know, a lot of people so since I've been, you know, doing these videos kind of responding to him. And by the way, the only reason why I've decided to speak out is because it's now been several years since he's left and he still like makes a point to go after us. He still tries to profit no off reason. of you guys. It's his it's his exactly. religious narrative. Exactly. And so finally, I'm like, okay, look, you're going to keep doing this, then I'm going to speak out. And so his fans will will come after me, which I think is hilarious. They'll be like, you're just jealous. And here's the thing. Um, I am jealous. And, and the reason why I'm jealous is because he has a certain ruthlessness that's necessary to succeed in this system. And I just don't have it. Like, I, I'm jealous that he is able to experience a life void of any, you know, consciousness, um, <laughs> guilt. Like, it's amazing to me because, like, here's, the fact of the matter is when he was working at TYT, he knows this very well. Um, that was when I started getting offers to leave TYT. And one of the offers was insanely lucrative. Like, they came at me with basically triple what I was making at TYT at that time. 
And I said, but they said, we need you to be exclusive to us. You need to leave. Right. And I wasn't willing to do that. And they kept coming back at me with more money, more money. And finally, I was like, look, if you guys are unwilling to allow me to stay at TYT and do this show simultaneously, then no money is going to make me leave. Because I knew that TYT would always allow me to speak my mind and they wouldn't censor me. And that was more important to me than making a lot of money. And so if I wanted to be like Dave Rubin, you know, successful, that's a very easy thing to accomplish in this world. You just have to be super, super guiltless. And I don't have that in me. No, I think, I mean, right now we could, hey, Anna, don't you think women should maybe like shut up? And the best way to have oh. air be clean is obviously to deregulate industry because you could write Yelp reviews of it. And if we were serious, mm-hmm. we could get bankrolled by the Cokes today for that show. And yeah. Kill it. Exactly. We could crush exactly. it. Exactly. It's the easiest yeah. hustle and on the planet. And especially if you were part of a program that had some influence, you know, some progressive influence and you're suddenly willing to shit on that program, I mean, yes, the offers would certainly come in. But look, at the end of the day, this isn't just about me. And I don't know, some people tell me I'm stupid for thinking this way, but hopefully eventually we'll see some positive changes. It's not just about me or my financial stability. It's about what I want to leave behind, right? right? And I'm not just talking about like my own family. I'm talking about this country. Like, Looking back, I don't want to be remembered as someone who was like, oh, the Koch brothers offered me a ton of money, so I decided to lie to everybody and pretend as if global warming isn't happening. And also, I just don't want people to think I'm stupid. Like, I don't want to look stupid. And Dave Rubin looks stupid on a daily basis. On a, on like a, I mean, as far as I can tell, like an hourly basis, because I've looked at his Twitter, too. <laughs> but I mean, wait, so Anna, you're telling me that you don't want at a specific point in American history where children getting kidnapped and put in cages, where inequality exceeded like the medieval era, where the last moments to reverse a catastrophic climate crisis, when like the whole global balance of power was shifting. You didn't want to be known Mm -hmm. as the guy who was on TV, on YouTube being like, you know, like what's going on at Oberlin's crazy. It's crazy. (laughs) And you're not promoting rape. You're just saying it doesn't technically exist, right? You don't want to be that person? Oh, my God. No, don't want to be that person. I watched one of your takedown videos where you said something along those lines, and I was driving, and I just started laughing hysterically. And I just remember being, like, stuck on 405 traffic. And uh, the person right next to me was like, okay, well, that person's insane. <laughs> but it was just so funny. That's awesome. Well, isn't that the best yeah. way? Like, I think it's awesome. Actually, I think it's really great that you know because as i say i do i think all of them are toxic reactionary i think even the ones like brett weinstein brett weinstein by the way has the most actual moderate politics and in some ways in some ways i'll say some again has the most sympathetic story the dude is going and testifying to a republican congress about campus issues now you all, mm-hmm. you're leveraging his, your own personal trauma about something that happened to you at a campus to literally go to a Congress that might literally pass legislation to literally limit speech on campuses. So I think all of them are really dangerous and problematic, but some of them, you know, some of them have ideas and and theories that, and, and also are speaking to needs in distorted ways that need to be taken on. Dave Rubin is really just like the perfect meeting point of cynicism and stupidity. And like, obviously I like to make fun of him because it's, it's fun. But I mean, I think that did, mm-hmm. you, did you get any response from coming out and actually taking him on like in, I mean, really in very ethical terms, you know, like I'm wondering if anybody yeah. responded to that because people, that's one of the things I get hit with all the time. It's like, oh, you're just an asshole and you're mean. And it's like, yeah, I guess so. But I mean, did those same people who get all sad about that, did they respond to your actual like call for integrity? Well, I think the, the response was mixed. First off, I, I just. I definitely believe that there are bots on YouTube. Yes. And um, I remember back in the day, uh, Ruben used to buy Twitter followers. I don't know if he still does. I have no doubt that he's buying bots on YouTube because the videos that I do will have like an insanely good like to dislike ratio for days. And then out of nowhere, literally overnight, the like to dislike ratio is 
you know, 50-50, and then a couple hours later, more dislikes than likes. Right. And you can tell when there are bots commenting on videos. But here's the thing. This is what matters. I do get a lot of response from people who used to be huge Dave Rubin fans. Right. And then they kind of started real. Because I don't think that everyone who listens to him or listens to his show is, like, dumb or easily manipulated. I think that a lot of them want to keep an open mind. They want to hear some of these interviews. But – when Dave agrees to be interviewed himself, like when he goes on Rogan's show or when he agrees to do an Ask Me Anything, I think that, you know, my arguments are kind of indisputable. Yes. And I'm not doing this, you know, just to be a dick and just to attack him. I'm doing this because it's just the truth. And I think that people deserve to know the influences behind the scenes and the reasons why he says the things he says. And the whole thing about college campuses, like my opinions on that are, are pretty nuanced because I teach on a college campus. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have some, you know, experiences pertaining to free speech and students and, and you know, how easily, the, how easily they get uncomfortable and disturbed. And I do think that it is a legitimate problem. Mm -hmm. However, I think it's absolutely ridiculous to take protests on college campuses and use that as, you know, a generalization for an entire political movement in the country. Of you know, course. we were all right. very different in college. So that's, I mean, just to say like, oh, there were some protests against Ben Shapiro. So this means that the left is against free speech. Like, fuck you. Come I mean, on. That's I mean, that's and also the other thing, too, that I and I agree with you, actually, just even strategically. Like, I think I've said this a million times, like, you know, if Ben Shapiro comes to your campus go up to and if you want to buy i would actually say just ignore the little prick because like most of the reason that anybody even knows who he is his like little overgrown like conservative media lab creation is actually because he's harnessed people freaking out at him but if you want to go right. and you want to kind of disrupt him then go read an excerpt of one of his novels like it's it's embarrassing come on man like do something yeah. that, that really but but at the same time like to be technical too which i think is also important that none of that stuff is in the legal and properly understood sense a free speech issue, right? Like the way those guys Correct. use free yeah. speech is like Dave Rubin's violating my free speech for not hosting me on his show and dunking on him. He's violating my right. free speech actually on a daily basis by not giving me a platform according to that metric, right? So that's the other thing is like, let's have yeah. a little precision here and we can have a critique of the culture and we can, you know, hash these things out. And I, and I would say, you know, even when I disagree with them, it is weird to me how little, you know, sometimes you talk to campus uh, activists who get summarized in a certain way in media, and I've had conversations with them, and it's like, oh, actually, their position is a little bit much more intelligent than is getting reported in the media based off of mm -hmm. these like, kind of like mm -hmm. generic stories that also are incredibly easy to report. But I think your point, too, though, that like a guy who's taking money from oligarchs to mm -hmm. both spread propaganda about things that he can't even properly do himself because he doesn't even understand the basics of like how to spread these erroneous economic ideas. And then he's also basically saying, yes, that a movement that is committed to, you know, all of the most important issues we face, whether it's climate or healthcare for everybody, is just consumed by like, oh, yeah, I was offended by some 90s comedy. Get the fuck out of here, man. It's a pathetic. Yeah, You're exactly. Lying. Yeah, yeah. It's so it's really frustrating. And and the thing that really started to get me concerned was, you know, during those Berkeley protests. And look, I, I disagreed with the reaction of some of the students. Right. But during the, that whole Berkeley protest debacle, you know, and Coulter wanted to show up. Ben Shapiro wanted to show up. There were threats by the federal government. You know, I remember right. Trump tweeting about it, exactly. threats about taking federal funding away from these schools. And that terrified me. Now, look, if I was from the Dave Rubin School of Thought, oh, fuck it. I mean, I graduated college already. It's not going to affect me. Fuck everyone else. But like it brought so much fear to my heart because I want kids to have an opportunity to right. go to a good school, you know, of and they, they, they're just totally comfortable destroying other people's lives for their own financial profit. And it just makes me crazy. So that was the thing that really started to, you know, make me pay attention to what was really going on. And I do think that the left and college students need to be way more strategic in the way they handle 
disagreements. Yeah. Because I think that it's actually a lot more powerful to ignore them than to protest them. They want the protest because they want to be the victim. Right. No, I think, yeah, I think uh, Angela Nagel, that Kill All Normie book, she really hit that dynamic really well. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that we can definitely have more of these conversations. And I will say this, Anna, that if for whatever reason, like I've, you know, I've fortunately like things are going well with this show and, you know, and, but at the same time, it's still a really, it, it requires a lot of work and mm -hmm. I would like to buy a home in Dubai. So on that <laughs> scenario, let's just keep in our back pocket, like. Maybe if black people took tests better, there wouldn't be racism. I will take my check. Okay, now. so that's going to be, all right, yeah, that'll be your issue. Let me think about mine. Um, women should stay in the kitchen. Oh uh, wow! Like and you're a woman, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the big problem right now is women in the workplace. If we didn't have women in the workplace, we wouldn't have sexual assault. So let's think about that. Yeah. Well, that's what I didn't say it. She did. I said the other really <laughs> fucked up stuff. And welcome back to another episode of The Renegades with Anna B Gasparian <laughs> and Michael Brooks. Definitely don't look at who funds us. It's like the synergy point of getting money from the most dangerous people in society and speaking to the like sexual pathologies of 15 year olds. So I guess there's a lot of money to be made <laughs> in that oh, meeting yeah, point. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> That's so scary. Anna Kasparian, I really appreciate your time. I look forward to doing more work with you, hosts and producer for the Young Turks. Thanks, Anna. Thank you so much, Michael. Don't you guys just picture Dave Rubin surrounded by IKEA furniture? Like deploying Twitter bots and looking to see like which Nazi accounts on YouTube have gone past a million subscribers for his guest list. Well, Anna and sort of the Ezra Klein Sam Harris debate, I think, sort of is instructive in con con comparison to our strategy, which is to like <laughs> take the mean cheap shot, and but instead, also read things correctly. Well, no, yes, we right, read correctly, right. but we use that as like license to take a cheap shot. True, and I like that, and I'm going to continue doing that. Yes, but the alternative so. is like. Like Anna says, she doesn't want to call any of them stupid or say she wants to consider them intellectuals, except Dave Rubin, right? But she's like... Uh, the, everybody, even the most generous people have limits. Yeah. Yes. Uh, because, but, but what happens when you give that bit of charity to them is then you can say things like they're fraudulent and they're buying bots and right. it lands a bit harder. So no I, no, I think, no, I think you're exactly right. I think the... I think you need both sides and that's one of the reasons that that track was so brutal because i was sort of like well actually nas kind of goes in between on ether but some lines are like you know some lines are more like <laughs> you look like a camel right and other lines are more like i'm sad that you're acting this way and so I I will take the the uh, the the camel lines, and Anna took the like, I'm like a proud big sister, but you lost your way. You have no integrity, and that synthesizes perfectly. I think Nas the and uh, Ether in particular is more on your end of the spectrum than it is. Well, I was honestly trying to th it is, but I was trying to think of a diss track that would be more like in sad. Like actually, first half of Adi Don is like that. But then he open, but it starts like that and then ends with like, and your co-writing partner has MS. <laughs> so it kind of, it kind of veers. It goes from that to a place that I wouldn't even go. Like if Dave Rubin's, uh, is he married? If Dave Rubin, if Dave Rubin had somebody important in his life with MS, I would not joke about that. I might say, uh, hopefully they don't. Are, aren't victims of the healthcare policies that? Well, actually, I don't even know what the that wouldn't even be a joke though. Yeah, no, that would that would no exactly that would just be an observation. But I wouldn't go tick tick tick. That man is sick sick sick. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't do that. That even for me. It's because you're completely against punching down. <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, when you put it that way, there's a lot of punching. Punching happens in many ways. Let's punch up. Let's punch up.
Well, I mean, the great thing about the very inviting part of Dave Rubin as a target is it's a beautiful hybrid experience of punching up and down simultaneously. That is like the very fun, like comedic pressure valve that the, the guy gives. It's like, you know, in baseball, the uppercut swing, mm-hmm. like Ken Griffey Jr., even yeah. though that's not a very efficient way to swing, it looks really cool. Right. I don't know why I'm going there. <laughs> it's cool, man. It's all right. It's a baseball. good image. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> When they go low, you go for the uppercut swing because it looks cool on TV. Ken Griffey Jr., 1998. (laughs) Um, And now, a segment which I take a risk doing every week. I will say anything about any IDW dirtbag, about any uh, Wall Street or oligarch goon that owns the global economy. I'll say anything about the foundations of capitalism, but I am afraid and increasingly concerned by some of the texts that I'm getting regarding this segment that we're about to do. Um, but yet we persist. Uh, I would just like to say, Miss, Mr. Wolf, nothing but respect from me, presumably from Matt. I'm sure Matt's choked his way through a couple of bong hits. Team David listening. Harvey all the way. Oh, <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Matt in a pincer move in support of Griscom's guys, I this is funny. Defend, is the defend music ready? all David thought. De- <laughs> David thought. Economic minute with David Griscom, that little prick with the Oedipal complex. <laughs> Let's do this. Well, I'm sure we've all seen those uh, stupid stories that warm every suburban dad's heart about super commuters, uh, people who have to yes. travel four or five hours to get to work. Yes. And of course, uh, we understand the uh, structural reasons why that those stories are quite uh, depressing rather than in, um, encouraging stories of perseverance. Oh, God. Um, but I wanted to talk about super commuters um, a little bit more broadly because uh, it is actually something that is on the rise. And primarily most super commuters aren't those t- those folks that we're talking about who are taking, you know, 10, 15 buses to get to work. A lot of super commuters historically have been rich people. So people who, you know, want to work in New York City, but they want to live in the suburbs and they, right. so they you know, take a job like that. West Don Chester. Draper. Yeah, exactly. All those characters. But over, <laughs> yes. over the last uh, decade. It's definitely the, the number... go-to for an economic section. <laughs> yeah, that would be. Fictional a... character. That's like one of those terrible 1960s. college courses. So we're thinking yeah. Mad Men and not Sopranos yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, over over the past decade, we've actually have seen uh, the, a significant increase um, in super commuters, especially among uh, low income and working class uh, workers. And, you know, these are in areas that you would sort of expect. So these are like Stockton, California, Modesta, California, New York City, Bridgeport, Connecticut, San Francisco. Um, so these are all communities where you have these like super powerful economic zones, which are becoming more and more unaffordable to live in if you are making a low income working class salary. So what we're seeing now is this large increase, um, not only in folks who are becoming super commuters, but in the amount of time that it's taking for folks to get in. Um, and what is, what's the major cause of that? Well, most of the low income workers who are super commuters use public transportation. So that's even in a city like New York, where it's like just to get into Manhattan, if you're in one of the um, outer boroughs, we've seen the degradation of our public uh, transportation system. Um, it's taking people longer and longer to get right. to work, which is increasing the amount of time that it takes to get in. I mean, you know, I mean, we, I don't even have to paint the picture of how terrible it is to have to commute, you know, 90 minutes, 120 minutes, an hour and 50 minutes. It's very rough. But just to give you an understanding of how much it's increasing, I have a couple numbers for you. Um, the worst city, of course, is San Francisco where the amount of super commuters has increased over 113%. Um, Another city, Seattle, home of Amazon, they've seen super commuters increase by over 65% over the past 10 years. And Portland has seen their share increase from 50%. Now, what's a unique thing about those cities? These are all tech cities run by our favorite people, you know, Google, Amazon, the The Fang, Fang, the Fang bros. And what's happened in these communities is not only has their public transportation um, system sort of been degraded, 
home prices have increased because what happens when you have these tech si these tech companies move into cities is you have home um, prices just skyrocketing because you have half the population making two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. You have all of these services that come in that are only geared toward the wealthiest members of the community, while you see working people suffer. You have that mixed with the fact that these uh, companies move in there and they demand tax cuts, they demand right. uh, you know cuts in revenue. So in uh, Seattle, we saw what happened with the city government, where even after trying to pass a very moderate uh, head tax on employees, Amazon basically threatened the city. This is becoming a huge problem across the nation, and it's something that is expanding. I mean, we're seeing uh, homeless populations um, in Seattle. The homeless population is around 11,000 people. Uh, and think about this for a second. The, it's only, the only cities that are bigger are New York City and, and L.A. New York City has uh, 76,000, and L.A. is around 55,000. And many of these people are newly homeless. Many of these people are people who had lived in these communities who have been uprooted from their homes because they can't afford to live anymore. I think it's really important that we start thinking about the social costs of these tech industries, not just in the disparity of wealth, but in what they do to communities. Right. Um, the, the, the flight of capital, the flight of, of avoidance of taxes has decimated city governments. And now we're watching this disgusting um, example with mayors fawning over Amazon's uh, second headquarters. So disgusting. And they're demanding so disgusting. between $5 billion and $10 billion um, in tax breaks to move into a headquarters. It's a mafia organization so look that out offers cities less than the mafia getting vetted by people who are theoretically public servants while they extort from the cities that they would plant their businesses. Disgusting. No, just disgusting. without a doubt. And we need to start seriously talking about solutions. And I'm just going to say this. I know it's going to get a lot of people very angry and my email bo inbox is ready for this. Wait, wait, hold on. But we need to start talking a little bit more seriously about this UBI fetish. And we'll talk about universal basic income in the Ooh. future. But there is a reason that uh, people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos right. and Mark Zuckerberg support it. Now, I know before I get a bunch of angry trees, there are many different types of UBI. I understand that I'm not necessarily against the idea. But what I'm going to say to you is this, is that we have all these social programs, we have all the social spending that has been absolutely decimated by these corporations. And I just think at this moment, we need to be talking seriously about uh, reforms that we can achieve that aren't going to harm people because a lot of the UBI um, platforms that I'm seeing raised are very much focused on automation and very much like yes. tech centered and they won't solve these problems because you look what these companies want to do in these communities they want to avoid paying taxes they don't care about the social services and there's no reason to think that they're going to you know come of you know have a change of heart when it comes into these new solutions they have for the tiered society that they are creating UBI for these people for the tech sector and the way UBI will be introduced in our current politics. There are good UBI programs, even moderate runs, the families, uh, Bolsa, uh, Bolsilia Familia, Lula, that was a very good program. There's much more radical conceptions of UBI, which really essentially are decoupling work from worth and freedom. That's fine. I think those are great. The way that it's going to be delivered by these people, this is their concept of 21st century tech feudalism of how to keep the serfs from uprising. Exactly. Any proposal that they put together that is forwarded by these people will be regressive, uh, disciplinary. The literature of Francis Fox Piven on the welfare state disciplining people is gonna be this to the nth degree with any UBI that comes out of a neoliberal Silicon Valley framework. It's very dangerous. And let's just not forget. Just and not fundamental. And let's not forget that, you know, these tech companies largely have profited off of uh, public and social good, off of uh, government programs that have, in, you know, created a lot of this technology that they are now using. So we should not be so cheap as to let them give us a little UBI yeah, each month me? and allow them to profit off of the entire um, social, um, you know, the society. A that little cash voucher and yeah. transfer from your Amazon <laughs> Prime account. That's a cannot drop make in up the bucket for a public good and a commons that has been privatized and generated trillions of dollars of profit while jeopardizing your personal security. It's disgusting. Think structurally, think deeply. On another note, sorry to do this. Um, Just make sure you do it well and you do it with passion. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. Just got a message. It's from, it's called uh, it's from literally says uh, uh, Richard Wolf, the best Marxist economist and podcaster on the planet. 
to that little asshole talking about UBI, how about <laughs> how about you super commute your way the fuck out of Brooklyn before there's a problem? Toodaloo, Dick Wolf. <laughs> I like the throwback there. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Whoa, shit. <laughs> no, all love to, to Richard Wolf. All love to Richard Wolf, as always. Everybody should listen to the economic update with Richard Wolf. All right. Now let's get to the segment, which is no love. This is genuine hate. We're, we, we haven't renamed it yet. We're still doing Gulag? Yeah. Okay. Um, as we say, we might always be switching this name up. You never know what the name may or may not be. But for now, it is still the gulag. And while we kid, this is no joke. This is somebody who, well, I shouldn't quote Biggie's somebody's got a die line, I realize, in the context of this segment. But this is somebody who in a just world would literally be in a gulag. And as I say, the only good reason for this person to still be on the scene is hopefully they will stick around and live to see their grandchildren grow uh, into adulthood and also live to see Bernie Sanders be the first Jewish president and not them. And of course, I am talking in the spirit of today's show, which is dealing with a lot of disgusting anachronisms from the 1990s. I'm talking about Joe Lieberman. And let me start by playing this clip, which should be a little bit of a bomb for the gamer community in the TMBS universe, which I will be the first to admit does not get a huge amount of love from me. I still stand by my pretty strict take a little bit of a break and go take a run. But I don't think that any games should be made illegal. And I don't sit in my platform, let alone the United States Senate, and ponder, you know, God, if there was one area I kind of wish the Constitution could be reformed around, it would be to make me allow uh, video games to be illegal. This is Joe Lieberman in his heyday talking about video games. Thank you, uh, Senator Cole, and thanks uh, to all the members of the of the panel. Uh, just uh, hearing what you've said uh, now, we, and we're also re repelled. We were disgusted by this material, and yet it is a measure of uh, our values in this society that we resist the impulse to do what I think. Uh, let me say for myself, I'd like to do. I'd like to be able to pass a law saying you can't produce this stuff anymore. We don't do that because we value our freedoms. But with those rights that uh, the producers of, of video games, in this case, have also come responsibilities. And that's been the other, the partner to rights in our society. And I think what we're all saying is that we don't feel that this particular industry has uh, carried out those responsibilities in, in the way that they should. And now's the time to change. Uh, so, and notice there in the third way theme of the evening, rights and responsibilities was the huge term that all of these guys used all the time when they were packaging, slashing the social state and deregulating Wall Street, or particularly in his case, focusing on anything he could do, literally anything he could do to help insurance and pharma. Now, why do I bring Joe Lieberman up? Because he sort of emerged from his not so discreet hideaway at a New York law firm, which has been associated with the Trump administration, as far as I understand, to write a melodramatic, sanctimonious, silly, if it weren't so disgusting, column in the Wall Street Journal, where he urged voters to cast their votes for Joe Crowley in the general election against Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. As you may know, Joe Crowley who did a Bruce Springsteen song for AOC, which now seems almost more like a sort of weird request for a date. He hasn't taken his name off of the ballot of the Working Families Party, so he still technically could run in the general election against her. And there's a lot of sort of rumors and waves about what's really going on there in terms of his level of interest and instigation of trying to undermine one of the most important and the most promising young politician right now in the United States. Joe Lieberman thought that this was a good time to go to the pages of the Wall Street Journal and say that AOC was bad for America and the world and call for things like a return to bipartisanship. Now, do I really even need to fill in 
that while this guy was spending most of his career worrying about Bill Clinton's uh, cavorting with an intern or trying to ban video games, that he supported every single military endeavor that he had the opportunity to vote for, from the invasion of Iraq, the war on terror, he's advocated bombing campaigns throughout the broader Middle East, Kosovo, of course. He was a major supporter of so-called welfare reform, the consequences of which we're still living with today, and the racialized rhetoric that we saw in that Clinton ad defined so-called new Democrats for a generation. After endorsing John McCain, speaking condescendingly and also in an oddly racially tinged way about Barack Obama and continuing on the sort of hopeless crusades of occupying Iraq and looking for, as I say, any possible war you could have with a place involving Muslims, Joe Lieberman was personally instrumental in making Obamacare worse. Medicare buy-in from 55 and up, he personally killed it. Public option, dead. This is one of the worst people in American life. And this is someone who still pops up from time to time to run interference for Trump or support any Israeli abuse imaginable. Which is, I guess, a way of saying two things. One, Joe Lieberman to the gulag with you. And two, what another great endorsement for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. That is the gulag. We're going to take a brief break, and then we're going to be back with crew and senior political editor for The Intercept, Bree Joy Gray. Welcome back to The Michael Brooks Show. Welcome, everybody. Joining us now is senior political editor for The Intercept, crew for The Michael Brooks Show, Brianna Joy Gray. Thanks so much for being back. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. I will just tease for the post game. You got involved. I'm Mr. Anti-Twitter Drama. You got involved in a Twitter beef that actually, like, I actually went back and forth with you on this last night on Twitter, which is also incredibly <laughs> odd that I would engage. I mean, honestly, just for better or for worse. back and forth for you? That was a, a For me, that's my definition exchange. of back and forth is like, <laughs> wow, this is fucking crazy. What's going on, Bree? And you're like, I know. <laughs> Um, so we're going to get to that in the post game, um, as well as a lot of other things. But you have seen, sorry to bother you, you wrote a very good piece about it. Thank you. Tell me about it. Um, it's a film uh, written and produced by uh, Boots Riley, who I am not cool enough to really have a lot of awareness of him before this film. Well, I will just confess. Out about him. I'm just finding out. My uh, boyfriend tried to hit me to things. Uh, when oh, it became I, relevant. I literally misunderstood what you said there. It's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Your boyfriend hit you because no. you weren't familiar with Boots Riley. Wow. <laughs> he tried I mean, to I, wanted, me I really loathe that. And on the other hand, I was like, wow, look at leftists getting serious about their content. It's like, no, he, you never heard the coup? What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> he informed me as yeah. someone who spent time in Berkeley about uh, the coup. Um, but, you know, it's a film. Do I just talk about briefly what it's about? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's a film I mean, about. I think a lot of people a, have a sense, but like, I, yeah, yeah, yeah I, go ahead. I think so, probably also. Yeah. No, but give us a brief synopsis for sure. Um, uh, this young guy, he is a millennial who doesn't have a lot of financial opportunities. He seems to be unemployed. He's been living in his uncle's garage for some unspecified period of time. He isn't able to pay his uncle rent. The uncle himself is about to get his house foreclosed on. It's kind of dire straits when his friend gets him a job at a telemarketing company. It's a you know a minimum wage type job in the basement of a building that's pretty bleak. His girlfriend also gets a job there until one day another coworker teaches him how to use a quote unquote white voice, which enables him to be incredibly successful and skyrocket to the top of the company. At which point he... He has an exceptionally good white voice. <laughs> right. And the white voice isn't about, you know, this kind of 90s uh, com- BET comic view caricature of a white voice. It's supposed to be this this voice that expresses this kind of aspirational uh, kind of contentment. This, this sense that you don't actually have a care in the world. That you're worry-free, if you will. I think they say your bills are paid or something Your like bills that. are paid. It's, yeah. very, it's a very... It's a very class mediated definition of race. Yeah, exactly. It's not like, yeah, it isn't like, exactly. Like, What's going on here? 
you know, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it Def Comedy Jam. Like <laughs> it does. It does. It, well, that was actually what I was going to say. I had it's a, David Cross. I had a minor quibble about that, actually, because they, they, I love the distinction that Danny Glover character drew. And then David Cross started talking. And I was like, maybe it should have sounded like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, like, oh, should have sounded like Army Hammer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, yeah. I mean, it, right. Who plays the, the right, villain later right, in the movie? Right. But I mean, that that actually, right? He did have that voice. Right? Yeah. And then David Cross's voice was it was great, <laughs> but it was definitely it was like, this sounds very Martin Lawrencey to me. Yeah. Um, okay, so so he does the voice. He skyrockets to the top. Yeah, and at the top, no spoilers, but he realizes that there are ethical, significant, huge, overwhelming ethical implications for the products he's being asked to sell. And, me and meanwhile, all of his friends down in the basement level have organized with the help of this organizer played by Stephen Yun from Walking Dead. Um, and they've gone on strike. So he's got both the ethics, ethical concerns of the things he's able, being asked to sell up top and also the ethics of crossing the picket line right. every day to go into work and earn all this money. But the money enables him to help out his uncle, pay off his yep. house and move into a new apartment and have some kind of personal dignity, get a new car, um, you know, things that he wasn't able to do before, you know, take his girlfriend out, feel like a valued and pr productive m member of society. And that's yeah. one of the things that I really liked about the movie, that it wasn't just that he made the money and got material things. He made the money and he was good at his job and that mattered to him. And psychological dignity. Yeah, because yeah. when you live in a world where th that tells you right. that your personal value is so tied to your professional value, there is it's more than just being able to earn an income. It's that satisfaction you get by being t uh, about from being told you that you matter. Right. Um, and so that that meant that for a period of time in the movie, I mean, you you don't begrudge him immediately when he chooses to persist in this job because he really was depressed. I didn't in begrudge the beginning. him at all. I think it was a very good thing across the board in that movie was that it was very and it did reflect. I mean, Boots Riley is a communist, and it reflect like that movie was not about individual sort of perfection or heroism pers persisting against circumstances at all. Yeah. Including down to like, uh, whatever. I, I don't, I'm very, I don't, I think if people get upset about spoilers, they have to deal with that. So we will try to <laughs> not right. give you all I the mean, spoilers. It's your show. We can do it whatever, whatever way you want. Well, I don't need to like tell them the twist, but like we're going to talk about it. And, sure. you know, so, and this isn't like, you know, this isn't a, you know, a fucking, I don't know, Agatha Christie novel. Like, this is not like, <laughs> oh man, you discovered capitalism was bad. The whole mystery was blown, right? But I think that the fact that they, as an example, labor organizer, you know, I was talking about this on Champagne Sharks with T, and I've had a, this conversation with a couple other people, and it was always came up like, why was it that he had this kind of like sort of, I don't even, I don't even know if I would say, honestly, I don't even think it was sleazy, but he had this like, other angle like this other sexual um like interest in the guy's girlfriend right and for me my interpretation was just really simple it was like he's a good organizer he's right about what they need to do and he's also like a dude yeah he was and cute. that's it like that, <laughs> that 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 it just reflected lack of i mean and and frankly conversely even the real evil guy had a story of self-justification. I thought the movie very much across the board was pretty good at like, it's about systems, not people. That really is the emphasis. That yeah. was my read. I, my only qualm with the Stephen Young character was that he didn't end up with her permanently at the end. I was like, look, obviously- Bree was robbed of a cucking. <laughs> <laughs> why is that gotta be a cucking? Look, he was, well, it was he literally was... was a cucking. I mean, why does it have, I don't know. No, they like, per Tessa Thompson's point, I'm sorry, I forgot the names of all of these, real, these characters uh, in the movie, but per T T Tessa Thompson's point, they broke up. They weren't on a break. It wasn't ambiguous. You know, Cash, uh, Lakeith uh, Greenfield, is that his name? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I forget his, his character. I forget his uh, Stanfield. Actor. Sorry, I'm reading Stanfield. off the paper in front of you. Um, he, his character acted up. He, he He's was, a great he actor. Was, he did. I want that to be true. I don't know. Really? But do you think he's just acting as himself? Because I watched him in a bunch of interviews for to to write this review. I mean, presumably he as himself is like an extremely successful actor is probably a little bit more. I don't want 
diminish grounded. him and I don't want to do that thing where a lot of people that a lot of people do with black actors where they're you know they'll be like in the wire and be like oh that's not acting they're just that way but they're like a Juilliard trained actor playing like a gangster I, I don't want to do that thing but also I read this long and interesting profile of him and how his acting career emerged and how it was very spontaneous and didn't involve a lot of training and he kind of just kept getting typecast and it, the characters the three characters that i know him from you know like it's get out atlanta and now this right are all kind of muted um kind of low-key you know kind of I laid he back had to do a lot more in this i mean just because he was lead, he was he was the main draw but i the one thing i will concede to you is i think a lot of why he works as an actor is honestly you just empathize with him uh, like in the sense, totally. not even as like, or actually maybe not as positively. He has like a, you don't want bad things to befall him because he seems like a very nice guy. And he's I don't authentic. know if that makes sense, but there's a lot of like, he leaps out in all of these different roles and you're just like, oh, please, could you like give him a break? Because he just seems like the last person that deserves it. Well, in this review, they were saying yeah. there, uh, this uh, article about his life or whatever was saying that he's very um, has these emotive eyes and all this. Yeah, stuff. But I think it's, it's just that he's very authentic. And even in the um, there was an anecdote where uh, a casting director or, or somebody was said to him, you know, I'm just going to save your picture because you have this look. You have that like down and out look. <laughs> like, you have this like struggle bus Charming. look about you. Yeah, that's kind of true. And, it, you know, yeah, like, it just feels like he's wrong. getting cast in these, as a type. And that's not necessarily right. his fault. fault. And maybe he has even more range. So than his we've next seen. role, he needs to play like a fucking gangster <laughs> or like some t- or like a sex fiend. Like, a, he needs like to just leave. an animated, perky. I, I don't. I just can you do animated and perky again, do. please, Brie? I like All that. Right. I like your. <laughs> I'm just saying, like that's what we <laughs> have. You know what I mean? <laughs> Animated, perky. I mean, have you, I haven't seen his. You know. Well, wait, I have a question. I want to get back to the bigger picture of the movie, but I, but uh, I'm just want to. Uh, not, we're not going to get personal, but I just want to establish a brief standard here, because I have to be honest. A lot of women, and I am not going to say how I know this. I don't think they take like the tight, technically you've been broken up with for three hours rule quite as literally as you do. First of all, we don't know how much time passed. Oh, in stop! You that always movie. do this. You, no, it was a very like, short period of time. Even if it, but it, if even if it were a short period of time, like he was the bad actor in the relationship. She, if she had broken oh, up yeah, with like him and then driving her ra- around in a nice car and taking her out for dinner, it's what a terrible guy! What an asshole! He literally <laughs> was a strike breaker. <laughs> What? Well, that's the politics. That's, that's, the, that's politics. the whole point. She was mad at him for his politics. You can't be mad at her. She was well, like, no, but she was conversely the the paradox. And actually, T made this point to me, which I agreed with. Like, when you go to her art space world, where she's doing this, like, frankly silly performance, and like, there's like this idea that it's really very elevated, and it's not. She's just kind of being debased. He's the only one. Like, even when he's the strike breaker who's giving into all of his indulgences, he's still the only one in that more elevated environment who can kind of make the obvious moral call because he cares about her. I think that scene was very difficult to read. If mm. I were going to put my finger on what I thought was the weakest part of the movie, yeah. it would be that scene. Now, I've heard Boots Riley say that he thought that her character was the closest to representing him. And I've heard him talk about, uh, and I write about this in my piece, about the limits of um, kind of political art and how if right. it's not connected to a movement, then it's yeah. useless right. and like like literally and figuratively performative. Um, and so I don't know what to do with that scene but it could be read as i don't know paternalistic like i don't i don't know how to read his intervention on her behalf in that room because the the movie didn't come back and prove him right that he should have intervened you know she never had some big wake-up call where she was like you're right i didn't like how that went down or Mm -hmm. i didn't feel like i got what i wanted to get out of that performance for all we know that's exactly how she wanted it to happen she got a lot of money she sold a lot of pieces you know, advanced her political agenda and everything was cool. So mm-hmm. I, it just, I think, felt like that was a loose end. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I had a different kind of read on it, but I think it's totally fair to say it wasn't, it wasn't, that wasn't a closed loop at all. Yeah. That wasn't a closed loop at all. But I just, but just to be clear, first couple of hours, we're good to go. Uh, if, if you are the person who was broken up with, 
Wait, wait yeah. a second. If you're totally. the person who's broken up with, then wait. you don't have to sit around Didn't waiting for that. Didn't she break up with him? Didn't she break up with him? Well, because of his trash behavior on his part. Yeah, so you're basically just, it's always the man's fault. That's I where, think it's that's the man's where fault, we're at. Yeah, it's just always the man's he fault. He literally was a strike breaker. What kind of politics are on the Michael Brooks show where we're defending the strike breaker I'm not, over I'm, this oh, union oh, no, no, organizer? No. I'm just trying to make the rules really clear. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. This guy. I have totally been of the. I, I have always. I have union always. Organizer. He wasn't that cool. I have always practiced the policy of whenever <laughs> that has technically gone down. Oh yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I just wanted to make. I just wanted, frankly, Brejoy buy-in on that. I look. I think as soon as the text goes out, you, me, frowny face. You're good to Here, go. Here's the rule. That's what I think. You can do what you want to do in any circumstances. Sorry, oh, these are like super slippery today. Um, in, in any circumstances, but you just have to live with the consequences of what you do. It's like when people say, like, are you allowed to hook up with a friend's ex? Mm. Sure. But you have to be like, you have to accept the fact that maybe you're not ever going to be friends with that friend again. <laughs> My board doesn't work. <laughs> uh yeah, no, that's true. Well, okay. And I agree. And she should have went with the organizer. Totally. She should have stayed with him. I feel like they let them kiss and let them have sex because they were making up for that Romeo must die moment. They didn't moment. have sex. They totally did. She they and the totally organizer? Did. I think she yes. said she... No, like, she said she did everything but... Everything but, like... Like, like, like I think the they... The kitchen sink, I don't think she I went think in... I don't think he... I don't think they technically... I, okay. By Bill Clinton's His definition, reaction was that they did. I don't think they went... They All right. sex. I think they... Regardless? I think... Well, no, no. We're Now we're figuring something out of the court. <laughs> 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 I think it definitely depends on it. Was I the only person who when Bill Clinton said it depends on what is is was like that? Exactly. Well, <laughs> That's like an awesome point. I was not thinking about it. You didn't see it later? I was. I didn't come back to the country until 2001. There was a different scandal afoot. Right. There was other stuff going <laughs> on. There was a little more heavy stuff than determining if blowjob constituted sex. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do think that that, w that scene was like payback for... Um, Aaliyah, the 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 non kiss in Romeo must die, which I've never I've actually never seen. seen. Romeo must like there's die. this no whole thing where they won't is. let Asian male, male characters be the love interest oh, and actually I interact. I see. Um, so that was the great like <laughs> Blasian love moment of cinematic history. Well, if and that's the case, it, then it really was, wasn't nearly enough then. And they should and let that stay was the with boy because then then you're in that <laughs> limited case you're totally right because if the point was was to be like. Here's an Asian guy who gets to like, like fuck the girl. Then they should have given him a lot. It should have, yeah. And a girl who gets to fuck the super woke sign slinging union organizer. What's this? Oh, sign slinging. Yeah, with union a little, organizer. Little, I don't know how cool little, that was. I think we. I thought it was we might cool. be getting a little bit of me and me and here. my X chromosomes over here. We're gonna, <laughs> wait, or or my the, the the fact that I am love. Whoop, a, a, whoop. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that, that I am the only one in the room, I believe, who likes men anyway. I'm going to weigh in on this. Okay, no, that's uh, all territory to you on that. <laughs> I just wanted to know the technical definition. So m on a more uh, serious note, you think this film synthesized capital and race in a really smart way. Yeah, Touch that's the that. best part. So yeah. <laughs> I actually, I agree. I think I, is, I almost yeah. don't even care how good the movie is or how funny it is or how it, like it is all of those things but what made me sit there with my mouth agape um was the fact that i was watching a movie where the central plot point was about organizing and collective action and that it wasn't a movie about you know poverty and people in dire straits where one individual by their wits and personal intelligence manages to make their way out and you beat the system. You contrast the Will Smith movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pursuit of Happiness right. from like 10 years ago or so yep. where it's a biopic about a uh, a man who was homeless for a period of time sleeping in, a, in the bar, a train station in, uh, in San Francisco, also set in San Francisco, in the, in the Bay Area. Um, and who managed to get this internship at a hedge fund or something yeah. and work his way to the top mm -hmm. and, you know, save his whole family, which is great. It was a moving movie. I enjoyed it. But this is a movie in which you saw it didn't matter that the protagonist was really, really good at what he did, that he was, he was a genius. He was able to get himself out because right. he was exceptional at what he did. 
everybody won at the end of the movie because everybody banded together. And it wasn't just that he escaped a system and got himself into another worse but better compensated system. They were able to actually change their conditions. In Sorry to Bother You? In Sorry to Bother You. I think that that's very open-ended, how it ended. I mean, it's no, they, they were taking the they right steps, but we strike. don't know if they're going to win. Well, I mean, we don't know if they're going to overturn yeah, I mean, the entire become, capitalist government. But, but they I think that's actually, I think that's true. But I think the big question part out of the movie really is like, I left it as this is how it is. You can, if you get real about it, maybe you have a chance. But definitely not like there was any type of inevitability of like a nice are you, ending for people. Are you Killmonger is writing this and saying that uh, because there was like a five minute scene at the end where there was like the community organizing center. That, that means Yeah, like, you know, Tita's does the thing where because there's just the end of the movie, there's a little clip where he's, you know. No, I'm talking literally about the end of the movie. It's open ended. We don't know. That's literally the case. I think that what's what I'm talking about is the fact that we know that they won the strike and there's a conversation about them all going back to work because they won whatever conditions they had asked for. Like that's, that's my point. And you can call that a minor victory, but in the grand scheme well, we'll of see. a world in which labor has gets no attention from Democrats in the public sphere, where the idea that there's anything that you can actually do to change your conditions, people, people feel like they're completely without tools as to how to change their conditions other than, making it big because there are going to be a musician or a basketball star or a lawyer or something ridiculous, you know, you know, something ridiculous. Yes. Something ridiculous. Like this, it was felt so empowering that you could do something just attainable and get yourself out of a bind and that you didn't have to do it alone. And that this wasn't sugarcoated. This was treated as a natural, ordinarily ordinary thing that happened in the course of this movie. And that at certain point you were rooting for the strike almost as a protagonist more than you were rooting for any individual person. Well, that's definitely, definitely achieved that. I mean, literally this would be a plot, uh, you know, definitely a plot. This would be an actual plot spoiler. And I will spare people this, even though I really don't care. But the very last part of the movie does not deal with that. It deals with the, the next layer of, yeah, of what? Yeah. No, no, literally it does. So, I mean, there's a lot of question marks in terms of like where we're going to go from here because, at least in his case, he already had been defeated in a pretty significant way. <laughs> so, we'll but see. the end ends with them. I mean, it does. It always flips back. It's the duality. It's not like I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave, I didn't leave the movie with a pessimistic read at all. And I think that was very refreshing and very much in contrast actually to a lot of movies that get a rap of being socially conscious. They're usually just various forms of poverty porn that leave you being like, oh my God, I should just do as many, you know, just have as much fun as possible here because that's it. Yeah. But I think that, but, but, um, no, I actually, I actually, in, in fact, I'm saying it as a compliment. I think it really pulled off really underscoring how disgusting things are, how corrupted, how much of a serious uphill battle it is, and also was like, and it's totally achievable, and it can be achieved in these specific ways, and here's a taste of it. I think it actually did that very well. But I didn't leave thinking like, oh, cool, we got this. I thought like, maybe. That was a good step in the right direction. I don't think that, yeah, I, I, I don't think that I'm saying that either. What I'm saying is that it showed that organizing works. Yes, and in I a think world that's definitely true. That's and he said as much in interviews. Full, filled with Afro-pessimism, which relates back to this ridiculous Twitter spat that I'm in right now. It's like we're in a, in a world where people have this deterministic view of race and racism and struggle. And there's this weird investment that people seem to have in the perpetual nature of the struggle, the inevitable and uh, unending nature um, of, of racism. And I find a class analysis, I think part of why I'm drawn to it so much um, in conjunction obviously with a racial analysis is because I find that there is an optimism there that just doesn't exist in a racial essentialized framework. Hmm. Um, and that's been my ongoing critique of a number of prominent um, black intellectuals and the white public intellectuals that echo them. I can't explain the black intellectuals, but on my strong suspicion of white intellectuals who echo that in such a limited way, I think in some cases, look, it's not a bad thing for white people to take racism seriously. So that's very defensible and correct. 
I also just get a sneaking suspicion. I mean, I said this to T because we were contrasting it with Get Out. Which I also think, I think Get Out's a great movie. Get Out is actually technically probably a much better oh, movie, yeah. frankly. Yes, it is. Right? Like it's if we're talking on that level. It's a very, so very... So tight and yes, coherent and just every part of it smart and yes, works perfectly together. Precisely. Yeah. So if we're talking on that technical level. But the thing about Get Out, one that always struck me when I, when I first saw Get Out, I was like, this movie is so good and so funny that like the Bradley Whitford character in real life would love this movie which is why it's so devastating. But I also think that there is a way in which the essentialized inevitability analysis of anything, by the way, allows, um, you know, it allows really very relatively, frankly, racially and financially uh, privileged people to perform secular Christian penance without putting any material risk on the table and that is really to me like i think just the unending you know mark blythe and it's funny doing conversations with him because he's it's not like a significant gulf but i mean he's from scotland like there's a certain there is just like a certain kind of change in frame and growing up under thatcherism and being blue collar and escaping economically but having a much broader structural understanding and his joke that he always says to me he's like he's like okay like I'm a 50 something white guy. I'm an econ professor. I'm upper middle class. I'm straight, all, you know, all the categories. He's like, I'm super privileged. I acknowledge that. I can keep all my money, right? <laughs> and he's like, and he's, and he was saying like, it's the extent to which in his, in his experience that the implicit answer to that is yes, is a very big problem. So that's my read on the white side. It's like, who doesn't want to simultaneously have a certain ethos of ethics and sacrifice without any of the actual follow through of, you know, cause again, that's, in, sorry to bother you also think did a good job of being like, yeah, you know, like going on strike is fucking scary. Like I didn't, you know, and, and, and especially frankly, I think it caught him really perfectly in, a, in an individual sense. He had an absolute right to be like, look, you guys don't have much to lose. I do. That's a that um, yeah, in a neoliberal that's environment. The that's the trap. <laughs> that's the but trap. But we it's exactly the, the trap. Handcuffs, and we the trap. and we precisely shouldn't pretend that the you know the trap isn't very real, right? But like but of course it needs to be overcome. It is the golden handcuffs. But I think that there is a a big market for the feeling of subversion without the act of it. Yes. Now I like I do I do think that there are people that don't kind of realize that that's what's going on, who are, are really in good faith. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think almost all of them, arguments. by the way. I think yeah. almost all of them. I think it's a, it's a subconscious thing. But I think when you watch a film like this, and it just feels so different sitting in your chair. Like my emotional reaction, my, I had this big goofy smile on my face the whole time. Like I was watching a superhero movie because I thought that someone was about to like win big. Like I was looking at like up a hero about to take on an evil and win. And as soon as I saw how it was going to frame up, I like, I could not believe my eyes. And it feels, it just, after, after like 32 years of just, just all the genuine, but so negative discourse around race. It just feels like a light at the tunnel, which is also why it was so funny to see so many people struggle to articulate uh, the class narrative of the movie and who could only kind of process it through the lens of race. Like I saw a lot of people who really love the movie online who who were saying things like, yeah, it's just a really great movie about how, you know, like black people can make it and race. And, and they were they were kind of filtering through really? the lens we normally I get. I thought it did a very, very good job of well, actually. Oh, what's uh, the movie's uh, fault? Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> like a strikingly good job of even just the technical distinction, which I keep hammering now, of the distinction between exploitation and oppression. Yeah. Like exploitation as a pure economic function that applies to even the most privileged members of the labor force, but literally talks about stolen labor as transferred to profit and uh, oppression as systems of literal oppression and obviously they connect and overlap but i thought they did an amazing job of of tearing that out and showing how they intersect showing how they're distinct i thought that was to me that was the most commendable part of the movie actually. yeah i think so too but it's yeah. the fact that so many people and i don't mean this in a judging way i just mean it, it it's it's a 
it's a commentary on where the discourse is that so many of us don't have the language to talk about things in class terms, even when we sit and watch a movie that's so obviously about class. I mean, even I included a quote from a Terry Crews uh, interview about the movie where he said a lot of really great things and it was really moving and he was connecting it to his experiences growing up in Flint, Michigan and how he recognized himself on the screen. It was a, it was a group cast interview. And I, I noticed that even among members of the cast, with the exception, I think Tessa Thompson got it the most, but people w apart from boots were kind of struggling. Like they weren't quite, they weren't talking in explicit class terms. They talked about, kind of the like a, oppression and how hard it is to make it and um there's a, a lot of explicit references to race that weren't even actually often from the movie or right. like they were kind of putting that onto the movie because the characters in the movie were largely black right um but it was just it's interesting to watch and to me like I'm glad this movie is here because I think it's forcing people to learn the right like the, to learn the language and learn how to think of their circumstances in ways that are different and in addition to um, kind of the the racial oppression frameworks that we're at this point as lib as liberals more familiar with right and and like I think it's also really important I'm, I'm on a, I have a project I'm working on now where I'm like I'm it's also dealing with the distinction that like there's so many big arguments and problems right now that just frankly need like a systemic material Marxist perspective, or you're not going to get out of predicaments just, and uh, not even as like a moral perspective, just like literally that's the path that's going to be available to deal with some of these things. And then when you go into the sort of still the broad debate, it's like, it still matters significantly. Like, you know, Ezra Klein, very limited thinker. He's, you know, uh, debunking racism and Sam Harris is promoting it. Like in that conversation, I have a lot more things that I would bring to the table in that conversation that are much more structural. But in the relative sense, I mean, yeah, we you, have a you guy really who's won me over with that uh, that one podcast. Well, of course, <laughs> of course, and I think that's the that's the dialectic that we have to pursue, and also even noticing the distinctions between like the people that you know, are holding a position in good faith that diagnoses a lot of things correctly and has limits. And then at the same time, this whole other, you know, like I've been noticing the phrase Afro optimism pop up recently. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, and very much in line with what we're talking about, it is, it is in your lane and it is also in the like newest version of the Moynihan report, Bill Cosby, pull up your pants, Coleman use garbage lane. And it's a very, I mean, it's our job across a whole variety of fields to explain like a pre and post critique, intervene where these arguments really matter and also enlarge the perspective. And there's a lot for us to do. And I do think the movie helps us do that. I do too. I would love to talk about the film, I think, in a um, predominantly black forum with some of the people who I know have pushed back against me for uh, making class analyses online. And because I've, I've seen this trend where there's people who really like the movie, but resist the class analysis right. or really like Ocasio-Cortez, but want to see her purely as an identity politics candidate. Right. And it's difficult to have those conversations online, but the, the movie Ocasio-Cortez figures like this, I feel like they open a door um, to breaking down people's, um, kind of like preconceived notions about what it means to um, value a class analysis. And it, it, the, these, a movie like that or a person who is both, you know, a person of color and a genuine leftist, it, 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 it they personify, um, you know, uh, the contradiction that they, that they think exists between those two things. And, um, is enables some walls to be broken down. I'm working on it. We're doing it. <laughs> Join us for a lot more. Oh, actually, really quick before we go to the post game, do you think do you consider Terry Crews to be a good actor? Yes. Okay, good. I just wanted to make I sure. I love I Terry Crews. Yes, he's I an do. American hero. I do too, but I just wanted to make sure because we're just setting a lot of clear boundaries. So, 
I'm gonna just say, if you're broken up, you're broken up. It doesn't matter who broke up with who or what, whatever the fuck. Sure, and you gotta as deal with the consequences that, of your actions on the break. I, I will deal with what are the consequences I choose to deal with, Bree. <laughs> Excuse you. <laughs> I, if I choose to not take responsibility for things, that's my choice. I'll choose that responsibility. Terry Crews is a great actor. Um, a little bit of smoke for the main actor, even though he seems like a really wonderful guy. No, I guy. like him a lot. Uh, but if he doesn't play, so you ready? In order to prove his worth to you, <laughs> the next so role insane. he plays should be animated, right? There are what was the other word you used? Look. Animated and what? Plucky, I think. Look, Plucky? Johnny Depp animated. has like an Oscar, I think, and he just plays the same character over and over again. That's Ooh. not a slight. <laughs> I feel like the best actors play the same character. I mean, I yeah, saw sure. that's basically uh, true. I listened right. to him on uh, Comedy Bang Bang, and he basically, yeah, that's him. <laughs> He's that dude. All right, then I take back what I said. He's not that great of an actor. Sorry to say. <laughs> but Brie convinced me. I thought you were great. If you're watching this, oh my goodness. all on her. Don't I thought you were super talented. And But you know what? Here's what I would say. I think you're an incredibly uh, likable and talented dude. And in your next role, if you play somebody who is plucky and animated, you can bring us over. We were going to stay here together into the post game. You can join us by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash TMBS, as, of course, the great Bree is. Thank you, Bree. Please um, help us get we're, – we're closing in on 2000. Um, and it is going to help obviously continue to sustain and allow us to start thinking about the next wave of things that we might be doing as we continue to grow and expand. Woke Bros live show with the Count the Dings Network at the uh, at the Bell House in Williamsburg on October 6th. You can hear more about that soon. Thank you, Super Producer Matt Leck. Chief Economist David Griscom, Super Producer David Slavic, Crew, Brianna Joy Gray. She is going to be with us in the post game. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>